I would like to introduce our first speaker, Francesca Cortufo, Professor and Associate Head in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences and Senior Scientist at the, at, at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory at the Colorado State University. The title of her talk is Carbon Sequestration in Soils. Over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Sarah, and everybody for being here today. As we heard yesterday, um, uh, humanity is really uh, facing um, a um, significant challenge um, with having to reduce carbon emissions from about the four uh, gigaton per, per year, with 40 gigaton per year we are having today, uh, to zero and also um, have um, a method to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere actually to below zero in order to stabilize the climate. And we need to do that at a time when the global population is still rising and therefore the, their demand for energy, water, land, and food is rising as well. We will hear today a lot of different solution and, and my goal is to drive you to one of um, the possible player um, in, this, uh, in this fight against climate change that we have, which is soil. Soils really um, have an important role because they lie at the nexus of these challenges because of the many ecosystem services they provide with carbon sequestration actually being one of them. And the reason why soils are so important um, for carbon sequestration is that they actually store an immense amount of carbon um, which is, we used to say, the standard is always the higher than the atmosphere and vegetation combined. Even in ecosystems like uh, forests that have high vegetation, the carbon stocks are always very, uh, very high. And so on one hand, we need to remember um, uh, to actually protect that carbon from accelerated decomposition due to warming and disturbances so that we don't uh, further exacerbate climate change, as well as manage our soils to also add more carbon in them. The reason why this might be possible is that actually during the history of our use of land, we have exploited our soils in a way that actually Jonathan Sanderman recently estimated we have um, eroded about 120 petagram of carbon from the uh, cropland and grazing land. And that in a way gives us an opportunity to manage, to change the way in which we manage those land in order to accrue the carbon back. And there has been a lot of studies point, um, uh, pointing to the, um, the ways to, uh, to do this. And this from Boster and others is actually one of, uh, possibly one of the most recent, that I like a variety of approaches we can use on land to uh, either um, uh, add more carbon or, and that's important to make a distinction, uh, avoid emission from carbon. But as Chris said yesterday, these avoided emission, we need to be careful not to double counting them. This is carbon that is currently in the soil. We just have to make sure that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. Um, uh, those soil carbon sequestration uh, strategies have several pros. Um, in particularly, most of them are relatively low cost. We know the technology that can be implemented with several co-benefits to air, biodiversity, water, food has uh, pointed in this figure. Um, and also, at least for what they concern agricultural land, they don't really need more land. It's just a change of management in the land that is already under agriculture. There are several um, uh, limits or, or um, cons or things that we need to um, we need to uh, be careful about when we look at carbon sequestration, and those are in particularly the difficulties to quantify the amounts and the longevity. Um, with those being the potential, there has been a lot of hype with doing it, but also a lot of criticism for whether those potential can actually be met. And uh, what I like to do with you today is go down what I think is a roadmap that can help us meet those potentials. 
And that involved, first of all, starting from the science and the biophysical soil carbon sequestration, uh, use that understanding to have accurate maps of where carbon is in each pool, how vulnerable it is, so that we can target our investment. Uh, and also design specific targeted management strategies for the different contexts. Um, but also we need to develop accurate low cost and high throughput quantification method and um, in, in interface uh, our, um, our uh, measurements with models that can use those measurements for actual verification and then um, include those models in decision support tools that stakeholders and farmers and industries can use to make those decisions. And the most important point is that we need to work together. And that's why I'm very excited to be talking to this audience today, because we do need to work with industry, our consultants, farmer and ranchers, policy maker, to get the infrastructure and incentive and extension that can allow to scale up uh, those processes. And finally, I, I also think that we need to keep do research to find more and innovative solutions. And so this roadmap, is also somewhat the, the, the outline of my talk. So let's start from the biophysics. The very simple biophysics is that if you want more carbon in soil, you have to increase inputs, you have to decrease outputs, and possibly you can work with the efficiency with which carbon is converted and increase that efficiency. We have a number of uh, approaches that we can use to both increase inputs and decrease outputs. Um, and some of them are, are very well known and can be implemented immediately. Other are more in the uh, face of research. In particularly, increasing efficiency is more in the face of research, but there is some very interesting uh, work that um, show that we can do that by improving the relationship between plant and microbiome or also the nitrogen management. But what I want to do with you today is actually stress the point that this biophysics is too simple. And as a soil carbon scientist, I'm not going to tell you about the complexity and all the difficulties of studying soils but allow me to say that we do need to make one step forward and uh, acknowledge that not all soil carbon is equal and the 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 most simplistic the next most simple approach that we can take and can bring a way um a, a way to a, to a way better stage is to actually separate carbon at the minimum in the two most distinct fraction which are the particulate organic matter and the mineral associated organic matter. The reason why we need to do that is because those two fractions are created by different process and so different management respond to, uh, they will respond differently to management. Uh, they have a different permanence with the particular being much, um, having a much faster turnover, whether the mineral associated can actually stay in the soil for several um, for several years. Um, and the other difference is the different in nutrition, I don't, in nutrient demand. I don't have the time to go into that today, but for sure the nitrogen demand of carbon sequestration is an important point and mineral associated require actually more nitrogen than the particular does. The particular is formed mostly from plant debris and structural material where the mineral associated is formed from the soluble exudate through microbial transformation. So why is it important to separate those two? First of all, palm is by far more vulnerable than now to decomposition, both to warming. And so when I was saying that we need to, be, to steward the existing carbon in soil, we mostly have to steward the palm carbon. But also they have different vulnerability to management um, with the um, with actually the, the mound being by far more stable and the palm being the the one that we lose to the point that we have actually very little palm in agricultural soil. The other thing that is important, and we touched on it yesterday, is the concept of saturation. Since mound require mineral to stabilize, it saturates and its saturation level depend on the amount and type of mineral in the soil, 
whereas the palm on this other graph will not saturate. The good news here is that the, the majority of the soil are far below the saturation level. And these are actually grassland and forest soils in Europe. The agricultural soils are typically down here. And so we do have a high potential for sequestration. And right now we don't have to worry about saturation that much, in particular if we focus on, saturate, on carbon sequestration in the deep soil. And the best map of carbon we have for the U.S. is this. They still highlight areas with high potential for carbon sequestration, highlight areas where we really need to steward the land to avoid carbon emissions. Um, but we don't have an accurate distinction between those carbon forms that can further drive management. And that's something I'm trying to do in collaboration with the NRCS and NEON. We are working on making a map of my own carbon and from carbon. And with those understanding, we can best drive management solution. Now, the silver line here that I'm very excited about is actually we do know how to inform users about what they should do on land in order to increase carbon. And we know from a scientific perspective, like this decision tree that post another published a few years back. And this is actually very similar to what the practitioner like understanding up and, and people like Gabe Brown that has learned from his experience what he needs to do on his land to sequester carbon. They are coming together and that to me is really highly motivating and exciting. And they both come to the point that carbon sequestration is context dependent which means again that we need to have the background understanding but we also need to work with farmer to educate them and, and, and give them the right decision tool. So what are those practices that we can do? There has been a lot of work, a lot of meta-analysis. Maybe uh, what rise to the top says in this meta-analysis is the conservation tillage in agricultural land has a solid um, um, benefit for carbon sequestration, in particular on the top soil. Tillage doesn't increase carbon at depth. Same goes for cover crop. Cover crop are really great at increasing carbon and improving its quality, mostly effective in the top soil. Biochar come to a different scale because basically it's an addition of carbon dense material in the soil that is recalcitrant and about 70 to 80 percent of what you put in is going to stay for centuries. But the problem with biochar is that we can't count from the moment we put it in. We need to count the life cycle of biochar from the feedstock to the moment in which we put it on land. And so depending on that, the carbon benefit can actually not be as high. Also grasslands can play an important role in carbon sequestration and they also receive the significant attention and Rich Ponand and others have done studies pointing to the potential how different changes in management can increase carbon in grasslands. We just completed a study in grasslands in the south of the United States where we did the quantification but also the separation of melm and palm. And here I point out that by changing management to adapt multipando, for example, we could demonstrate that not only they increased about nine tons per, per hectare over a period of about 10 years, um, but also the majority of the carbon was, was occurred in Merom and so it was mostly. But of course not everything is so easy and uh, um, uh, carbon sequestration might lead to n 2 emissions and I know that David will talk more about that later uh, but that's something that we need to be aware of and this is actually a meta-analysis that hasn't come out yet in global change biology uh, but it will soon and, and it shows that, for example, for some of the carbon sequestration, but the, the practice that accrue carbon, they might release um, N2O. And so that is something to watch out. All of these studies, or the majority of them, um, have been done mostly as independent studies on uh, uh, experimental stations and, and uh, some on farm work. But what we really need to be effective is to move to a larger scale. And I am very excited about the fact that industries are actually jumping into this 
and helping us to move to a different scale. Um, uh, Indigo is playing a big role in this work and they have launched an initiative for which they are um, monitoring carbon sequestration in a variety of farmland all across um, the, the, the mid-US. Uh, but other similar initiatives uh, are currently being done and supported by General Mills, McDonald's, um, uh, TNC, TNC, and so forth. So that's really exciting. But the moment in which we change scale, it means that we need to start analyzing thousands of soils. And so, you know, that's a, I, I have a lab in which I analyze soils, and the moment in which I'm telling you that you not only have to quantify carbon, but you have to quantify carbon in male and palm, I also understand the importance of, uh, of, of providing um, a solution for high throughput analysis. And that's something we are doing at CSU, where uh, we are working with engineers to design instruments that can automatize the, for example, the soil organic matter fractionation in male and palm and couple those analyses with mid infrared spectroscopy and other methods that can um, uh, that, that can analyze with a high throughput and low cost high number of soils and then we need to work with the um, continental scale database and statistical uh, approaches like machine learning to really get to those maps so that's something that i'm very excited and, and we are working on in my lab Finally, these kind of models then need to enter decision uh, support tools, uh, as for example, the already um, great tool like Comet Farm, Comet Planet, that uh, need to uh, be um, available to the stakeholders to drive, um, to drive their, their decision. Uh, but ultimately, really what we need to do, and again, I stress how great it is this, this meeting, is we need to work together. A couple of weeks ago, I, um, I, I'm collaborating with General Mills on a project on, uh, on, uh, on grain farms in, in Kansas, and we hope to expand it to Oklahoma and Nebraska. Um, and it was great to work alongside um, uh, ag, um, consultants and farmers to really see and demonstrate on the land those regenerative practices and how they can uh, again be a win-win not just for the soil health and ecosystem health but really for the economics of the farmers. Finally, um, we need to, um, to still uh, um, uh, uh, move the research forwards because as I stressed multiple times that we do have the know-how to start today, we also have to keep doing research so that we can find innovative solutions that can potentially sequester even more carbon or increase the permanence of the carbon we sequester. And so for example, CSU, Matt Valenstein and others are working in collaboration which is industry of all kinds, uh, to, for example, study how lactobionate might have a role in carbon sequestration. And you can imagine many other side products that could have similar effects. The other thing that I mentioned in the beginning that I think it can be important is improving the connection between uh, um, plant and soil microbiome to increase that efficiency. And that can also be important in increasing the tightness between the nitrogen and the carbon cycle and make a uh, carbon sequestration um, uh, you know, more effective also in terms of not losing the, the nitrogen. Um, and some of you might have seen it, well, I don't know, now that I'm at home, I lost track of time. I think it was a month ago that came out in Nature, a paper from a British group that showed how um, we can actually um, sequester carbon by adding uh, possibly silica rocks to agricultural soils. Um, and so this is just to give an idea, but uh, for sure, we still need to um, support research uh, in a way that we can find innovative solutions. So in conclusion, I want to stress again once more, I really love the fact that we keep stressing this, um, is that um, by no means what we are saying has to take away from the need to decarbonize the energy sector. 
said that soil carbon sequestration can play an important role to help lowering CO2 down, um, in particular because we have that very short time scale and also because carbon sequestration has a ton of core benefits and can um, increase soil health and improve the um, sustainability and resilience of agricultural uh, soil. I think that implementing soil carbon sequestration at scale is actually doable um, uh, despite all the skepticism in this, um, in this field. And, uh, uh, and I hope I have um, illustrated you what uh, we should be doing or we can do in order to um, meet the most of those potentials. Um, um, but we do need to work together and we do need to, to have, um, again, uh, collaboratives between industries, um, uh, practitioners, scientists, and so forth. I do like to stress, and I know that I'm fight back on that because people say cost too much, the throughput is low, but it is important that we um, move not just to consider carbon one thing, and we might put dollars on carbon that it stays in the soil only for a few years. It is important that we separate the carbon that might stay for longer and have a different function from the carbon that stays for a limited amount of time. I'm very excited that the Colorado State University, we are actually enacting on this roadmap and uh, creating a soil carbon solution center to uh, exactly create those collaboratives and, and start working on making those solutions um, a reality. With that, i like to thank um, all my uh, group and great collaborators and all my funders and of course all of you for your um, attention. Thanks. Thank you, Francesca. Great to see all that you're working on at Colorado State. Um, I'd like to um, turn it over to Jenny, to, who is uh, running the uh, Q&A this morning. I can see we already have a number of questions that have come in. Please uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and continue putting them in, and uh, Jenny will call on some folks to ask their questions now. Thanks, thanks Sarah. Thank you, Francesca. It was a lovely, wonderful, informative talk. Uh, we have a couple of great questions here. Um, Laurie Weyburn, uh, would you like to unmute yourself when you're uh, able to and ask your question? One of the things I would be curious about is it does sound like organic farming and holistic range management approaches are really superior methods for enhancing soil carbon. Um, both they have lower inputs in terms of petroleum-based uh, fertilizers, pesticides, etc. And they have enhanced soil organism populations uh, as contrasted with somewhat more intensive agriculture. What does your research show about this? And uh, do you have any thoughts about impediments to broader implementation of that kind of approach? Um, yeah, I think you are uh, perfectly right. And actually, you know, we have been thinking about the fact that um, uh, uh, you need to diversify the rotation and uh, increase the nitrogen input from um, uh, from uh, um, uh, legumes, uh, but when we worked at um, uh, grain rotation, so without all the holistic uh, regenerative approach that you mentioned, and, and just maintain the continuous cropping and introduce legumes in the crop rotation, we actually didn't have the same, um, the same results as the holistic approach. Um, and, and that, I think, is because, for example, the legume uh, have low, um, low productivity has used as a grain, like if you have a pea crop, um, doesn't actually have the same amount of input. Um, and, and also the stage of the inc introducing um, the perennial stages and diversify the root inputs. Um, those are all great things that only the holistic management and the introduction of animals in the rotation um, really move the system to a different level. So um, I, I do start to believe uh, that to have the very enhanced respo responses and not just move the needle to a little bit, um, the most successful also for the economics of the farmer um, is to go into the holistic 
how much that much the economy of agriculture today, it's hard to say, and maybe that's something that Dave can speak to better. But, but from a soil standpoint, the holistic management is the best. Thank you. Uh, we'll take another question uh, from the audience. Jessica, would you like to unmute yourself when you're able to and ask your question? Sure. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Great. Yeah, no, that was a, a really, really great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I found the map of the European palm and mayom really fascinating. And in particular, you know, the fact that there's this abundance of palm in, in coniferous forests, for example. And in thinking about implementing nature-based solutions and, and considering that many of the common pathways are in the forestry space, I was wondering what your opinion is of possible amendments to forest soils to either increase the mayom concentration or, or somehow increase the recalcitrance of palm in, in forest litter and soils. Um, so it, it also depends on the, on the soils, of course. And, and one thing I want to press, uh, to, to make sure is that we are talking about the mineral soils, not the organic layer, uh, because on top of that, there is a huge amount of organic material that is even more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the point to consider is that at least in Europe, Forests, given the long history of land use, forests are on the most sandy and acidic soils of Europe. Um, and, and, and so there is this uh, connection between uh, the land use and the soils and, and how much you, know, you, can, you can do with that. Um, I think that, um, and the other thing is that conifers only associate to ectomycorrhizal that also um, uh, are prone to form more um, palm rather than, than meum. So there is an inherent limitation on how much meum you can, sequ you can sequester in, in, um, in forest. Um, uh, you, you can work um, with, uh, again, trying to diversify the forest because, for example, the deciduous forest are actually much more similar to the grasslands than they are to the conifers. And, and, and some deciduous, mixed deciduous forests can also have a, um, uh, a buscular mycorrhizal uh, that can promote meum formation. And so I, I think that, you know, for established conifers forests, there is so much you can do. Um, if you are regenerating forests, um, and, and afforesting, it's important to understand what's your soil, what's the potential, and design a forest that possibly is a mixture um, so that you can accrue also mound to having more deciduous and to have more abuscular mycorrhizal trees. Thank you. I'm hoping we have time for one more question. We have a lot of questions that are, we probably won't get to, unfortunately. So um, Christian Davis, would you like to go ahead and ask your question once you're able to uh, unmute yourself. Yep. Hey, Francesca, thank you for a really brilliant presentation. I think a lot of the work you have done and are still doing in terms of mechanistic understanding of how soil carbon accumulates is really kind of pushing the boundaries of the field. So thank you for doing that. Um, do you have some idea on how far away we're actually going to be able to, how far away we are from being able to manipulate uh, the processes to drive and increase carbon stocks uh, and do you think we're in the future we may be able to get to a point where we can just analyze a sample and kind of propose a tailored solution uh, to farmers in the future yeah so i i'm actually not a strong believer of the um so i do think that microbes are the the engine that really drive how much stays and how much goes and uh, what, what, how much form is formed, how much meum is formed, uh, but they respond to the, the, the management and to the plan. And, and so in my opinion, again, actually going back to the holistic um, uh, method, uh, I think that we are not far from creating a very integrated plant microbe relationship and you can get that by um, by by basically um, having um, the, the the mutualism that we see in natural system where the fungi bring uh, the, the microbes bring the nitrogen 
uh, either by fixation or by scavenging to the plant and the carbon and the plant provide the carbon. So if we stop fertilizing and we, we start promoting that plant microbial interactions, we are a long way there. The other thing we need to do is to have more roots and deeper roots. Plant breeding has been done so that our crops have an absurd shoot to root ratio with roots that are unexistent. And so we need to change that and we need to have crops that have bigger and deeper roots uh, so that you can put that carbon in the soil and you can start that relationship between microbes and plants. And with and, and, and we know that. So I think that as long as we decide that that's what we want to address and we put the money in addressing it, uh, it's not actually hard to do that. From the um, measurement standpoint, I also think we are not far out. Again, it's mostly a matter of investment. Uh, but one thing that I don't believe is that we can get accurate, we can get the type of carbon measurement that we need uh, from throughput uh, directly in the soil. But what we can do is to have great models that are fed by continuous uh, water sensing data, NPP sensing data from remote sensing, te temperature sensing. So once you have a good model that you can e initialize with measured data and you have good sensing, continuous sensing data that feed it, you can actually have, and, and, and you can have, for example, at the tower that continuously verify the outcome. You can actually have pretty accurate carbon estimates without having to dig holes in all your farms. And so we, we know what we need to do. If we get the investments to do it, I think we are not far out.